Coming up on This Week in Radio Tech, we're talking to two experts on remote control installation and configuration. Those are Josh Bone and Josh Jones. We're going to keep, we're going to try to keep their names straight for the show. It's coming up next on Twerk. This Week in Radio Tech is brought to you by Broadcasters General Store with outstanding service, savings, and support online at bgs.cc. By Angry Audio. Audio problems disappear when you get angry at angryaudio.com. And by Max Connect Wireless, prioritized high speed internet service designed for transmitter sites and remote broadcasts. Hey, welcome into This Week in Radio Tech, the show where we talk about everything from the microphone to the light bulb at the top of the tower. And, and so often, you know, these days, it's it's not the light bulb at the top of the tower where the, the signal ends or launches. It's, it's launching into the, the Ethernet. Uh, not, not only the Ether, but the Ethernet, uh, as in the, the, the Internet. So we talk about getting audio content produced and getting it out and getting it sounding good and making it wonderful. Although we do focus on radio because, you know, 97% of uh, U.S. people above the age of 12 still hear radio every week. And I think it'll be around at least for a while in some form. I'm Kirk Harnack, your host. I'm here in Nashville, Tennessee at the uh, studios of the Telos Alliance studio uh, here at my office at my Telos Alliance office. Thanks a lot to Telos for making it possible for me to do the show. I got some some gear they supply over here. Kind of cool stuff. All lights up and everything. And uh, also let me uh, have uh, an hour every Thursday to kind of get this done. So thanks a lot. All right. Uh, on today's show, we've got a pretty interesting show with a whole lot of you know, take-home ideas. We're talking about technology, about uh, monitoring and control, combining and control, I think is the name of the episode, combining control. And we'll tell you how that'll work here. Well, starting now, I want to bring in, first of all, my we have two guests today. Chris Tobin is not with us, uh, but we have two guests. And one of those guests is my friend, and he can be your friend too. He's, he, he doesn't object to things like that. It's Josh Bone from Alabama. Hey, Josh, welcome in. Hi, hi, Kirk. How are you? Oh, oh, that's, that's the, the other Josh. Josh. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is going to be great. We have we have two Joshes on the show today. Maybe I should just go by Josh for the next hour myself. You know that would uh, reduce the confusion considerably. Jay Harnack, absolutely. Josh Harnack, <laughs> J all the way. J H J Harnack. Oh my goodness, Josh Harnack. So Josh Bone, uh, tell me a little about you. You've been on the show before, but it's it's been a while. Who are you? Yeah, it has. I'm doing good. Um, doing good. Uh, Bone Broadcast is is we're staying busy. We've got lots of projects going on right now, but not too busy. We're still out to help as many people as we can. Uh, Max Connect is growing, and um, overall, things are doing pretty good. I've got a four-year-old that's about to turn five, and yeah. So. <laughs> Four-year-old is about to turn 12, probably. Oh, no, he thinks he's 20. <laughs> Ask him, how old do you oh think you are? I'm 20. <laughs> So what what we uh, you've had a couple of uh, big projects here lately. We, we won't delve into them just yet, but you've had a couple of big projects where um, I found out something today. I, I was today years old when I found out that you are like the only authorized, certified, you know, official Burke installation configuration company uh, in North America. Yes. That's uh, that is true. We uh, went through the factory training and got all that situated. So yeah, we can go out on behalf of the factory and put your project in, do a full turnkey, provide you with the gear and everything. And uh, we've done that quite a few times in the last year. So, and, and with with today's multi station uh, broadcast systems, and there seem to be more and more and more of these, and I mean combined antennas, things like that. Uh, there's a lot to worry about. This isn't just this isn't your granddad's this. And I'm a granddad. This isn't your granddad's remote control anymore, where you just hook a few wires to the transmitter and calibrate some pots and and and, uh, and tell the jocks how to turn the transmitter plates on and off. No, it's a lot more complicated than that. So we're going to get into that and and some of the, the the considerations that you have to make to to have a project like this, where there's a honestly there's a lot of things to go wrong, and you got to protect against that. So that's coming up. Also on the show today, uh, we have another guest from the McKinney, Texas area. Also goes by Josh. It's Josh Jones, or we're going to call him JJ. Hey, JJ, welcome in. Glad you're here. Thanks for having me on today. So, JJ, your your position, uh, you're associated with uh, Josh Bone, JB, and uh, you know he only picks the best people. <laughs> so, uh, tell me what you do for for Bone. That's Broadcast. what I'm told. Right, I am head of the repair department here. So, when stuff breaks and it shows up at the uh, office here, I fix it. That's that's pretty much my gig, and we also do a little bit of field work on the side as well. I'm going to have, I have, I have questions about repair. We're going to, we're going to get to that in just a bit. So you hang tight uh, because um, yes, I know the repair business can, can be pretty interesting. 
I'm a little bit involved with that, or at least I have some visibility because uh, I work for the folks at the Telos Alliance. And we have a repair department, of course. People send gear in uh, that uh, that has a problem or they think has a problem. Uh, and once in a while, it's a problem we've never seen before. And sometimes that's actually true. So we'll, we'll talk about, about repairs and uh, what challenges are. And as, a, as an engineer, you know, um, JJ and, and JB both are going to help us decide as an engineer, when does it make sense to have a third party like uh, Bone Broadcast repair something versus t- yeah, taking your time as an engineer to uh, educate yourself and troubleshoot it and try to fix it, uh, maybe with parts that are made of non-obtainium a- anymore. So uh, obviously, uh, Josh and Josh, you know, have a bent toward, yeah, let us fix that for you. But I'm sure there are plenty of times when n- either a fix is non-feasible, not advised, um, or, hey, maybe maybe there's just something else wrong. Maybe, maybe it's cockpit error uh, and the box doesn't actually need to be fixed. So we'll talk about all that coming up. Uh, hey, our show, first of all, you know, I want to I want to get this not just out of the way, but I want to make sure people know about it in a big way. And that is our show is always brought to you in part by uh, Josh's product, Max Connect Wireless. And I, I know I talk about this enthusiastically on every show now because I'm really enthusiastic about it because it, it, it freaking works. Uh, it's just amazing what this box can do. And the inventor, the guy behind this who thought of this idea and actually making it work is our guest today. So JB, where, tell us about where? Max. <laughs> tell us about this. And actually, first, give me the crazy statistic about a, na- a nationwide broadcasting company is loving this so much that they've they bought a bunch of them. Yeah, there was a there was a press release that we sent out. Oh, I don't know, six months ago that Urban One had signed a deal with us to do a strategic deployment. They they put they were starting to put them at some of their transmitter sites as part of their new IP rollout. And recently they've placed an order for 47 of them. Those are all going to be for remote use because mm. part of the joy of Max Connect, in addition to the priority, which cuts through all the clutter and gets you past everybody's cell phones, is the fact that they all come with a public static IP address. So a good way to utilize that in a remote setting, especially in a corporate environment, is you can then close all the open ports on your corporate firewalls and whitelist your Max Connect IP addresses so that they're the only things that are allowed to connect back in. That means that all the Russian spam bots and hackers and call spoofers that tie up your codecs go away because when they do a port scan, there's nothing for them to scan. It's Literally just, it scans, it says everything's closed because you've whitelisted the IP addresses that you want. Uh, so there is a a huge benefit to that in this day and age of firmware flaws and exploits that if you have a device and the firmware update that you just did has an, a flaw in it, a hacker might find that before the manufacturer can send a patch to it and you know, you may get someone who can figure out how to can get a reverse command prompt into a Linux OS which then would give them access to your network by yeah. deploying it the way that these guys are doing it. That gives you the ability to restrict who can connect to any of your devices. So I'm holding up, um, I'm holding up the one that we're using from Max Connect, and this is a, a cradle point, what um, uh, 4G wireless router. But it's the cra- whether it's cradle point or something else, that's not the key. Tell me, what is the key to a broadcaster getting awesome? reliable data that's wireless that doesn't depend on how many other people are around you using wireless using carrier data what 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 makes this work it's all in the service we spent years negotiating deals with carriers to get us the priority that puts you above everybody else on the network there's no hardware magic in this we actually we we offered cradle point for years as the main and almost only hardware option but since in the last probably four months, we've diversified and we have hardware offerings from Cradle Point. We have hardware offerings from Digi. We have hardware offerings from PepWave, which is most people have heard of PepLink because of load balancers. But PepWave yeah. makes some really, really nice LTE routers. Um, we've got a couple of different of those to offer. We've also got a new company that we're one of the only places in the U.S. that you can buy it called Teltonica. They're from Lithuania. And their routers are are ruggedized. They have lots of features and bells and whistles, and they are stupid cheap. So they're almost to the point of being reliable, but if something happens to it, they're cheap enough that they're disposable. 
and yeah, yeah. that is that's a nice option especially for a situation where you're going to send it out in a remote bag or something like that you don't want to send a fifteen hundred dollar router out in a remote bag where it's going to get all beat up you buy two of these and if one of them dies then you pop the sim in the other one and <laughs> off you go so that's a sure. that is definitely a plus and and i i take it that I, Kirk Harnack, can't walk into my carrier and say, I want my uh, data to be more important than everybody else's. That That's not, I couldn't get that done, but that's what you've done with Max Connect Wireless. Yes, it's uh, the carriers don't acknowledge that we exist. That it's <laughs> funny because if you call and ask them, you know, I want priority data, they're going to tell you they don't do that. And it doesn't exist. Like I said, yeah. it, it took me years to get to the point where I actually found someone who was mm. willing to even discuss this with me. And then it took me longer than that to get them to actually sell it. We we've had Verizon and AT and T now for quite a few years. We recently first of the year, we just added T-Mobile and with T-Mobile's purchase of Sprint, their network is growing significantly. So they may be a better choice than a Verizon or an AT and T, depending on what market you're in. And we've got the same thing, static IP address, priority, all that stuff. So, you know, you can get T-Mobile the same way you can get Verizon or AT&T from us. That's one of the questions I get asked the most is, you know, well, I, what do I need to do? Do I need to call AT&T and sign this up? I said, no, no, we're your ISP. We are yeah. who you buy your service from. We will send you a SIM. You don't have to deal with carriers anymore. You deal with me and my team, which is we, we pride ourselves on being a whole lot more pleasant to deal with than any of the carriers. So you know, we deal with all the back end garbage and stuff like that. We are still developing things. We're constantly trying to develop new options, new products. The other big thing that I don't tell people about nearly enough is a product that we've got called Max Phone, which is just a VoIP to POTS solution that you can get along with your Max Connect. So if you still have a dial up remote control at the transmitter site, or even if you have a brand new Arc Plus Touch with the RSI, but you want it to call you and wake you up rather than, you know, I have a lot of people tell me text messages don't make way up, wake me up, but phone calls do. Okay, great. This has been, we have, have massaged this so that it will respond properly to the DTMF from all remote controls. It'll even work with sign systems. Nothing where a pots lines don't work with sign systems half the time. So these, the max phone service is a very cost effective way to get a pots line at your site that your remote control will actually work with. Gotcha. 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 That, that, that's, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Cause a lot of people do have, have pots gear. That's 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 neat. Um, all right. Well, hey, that, that this may be the the best and maybe the longest Max Connect ad we've ever done. But it's so important for broadcasters who need to go out, do a remote, and have it be reliable, uh, and not have it. Or, 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 we don't need that on the air, and you don't get that with Max Connect. Or if you need a backup STL method, a temporary STL to a transmitter site, it's great for that yep. too. And as 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 you know, uh, we had we had no internet at our uh, radio station in Mississippi um, after a tornado came through. And we didn't have internet for five days. Uh, I got there as quick as I could after about three days and uh, used my Max Connect to give us internet at our radio station so we could get back on the air. So thanks we also Max do. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. We also do offer uh, significant discounts for large groups. So the more you deploy, the mm -hmm. deeper your discount can get. So that's an incentive for you know corporate rollouts like Radio One did. The more they deploy, the better their rate gets. And yeah. You know, we're never going to be the cheapest thing out there. You're always going to be able to walk into your Verizon store or call your Verizon business rep or whatever, and they're going to give you some rock bottom rate. We can't do that because of the additional services that we offer. But there's also yeah. no commitment. Right. So if you get it, don't like it, you can cancel. There's no contract. There's no argument. You know, we all stay friends. So so that what I guess that implies that, hey, we've got an annual big remote from, I don't know, Bonnaroo down the road here in Tennessee. Yep. And I want, I want mass connect service for a month. I, you'd actually let me do that. You don't even need it for a month. We, we do short-term rentals. We're renting okay. one to a uh, public radio station next week for two days. Oh, and okay. it's, you know, it's not overly expensive to rent it. If you need it for a week, we charge you a fixed rate. Um, we give you a maximum data cap. So if I rent it to you for a week for, you know, 200 bucks or something like that, you know, if you use some astronomical amount of data, I'm going to say, yeah, I'm sorry, you went over your rental agreement. But if you're just going to get it for some big remote, 
we've had a couple of major market clusters do that where they've just called up and said, hey, the salesperson screwed up and forgot to order internet for this event. And we called the <laughs> yeah. vendor and they said, it's going to be five grand. What can you do for me? Okay. Yeah. And I rented them a dual carrier box for a month for like 400 bucks. And they were <laughs> thrilled to death. Well, I'm excited to talk about this technology and, and don't mind your ad going over because really this is technology that engineers need to know about so that they can save the day when they need to save the day. Uh, if they need to provide a solution for a remote broadcast or uh, you need to get IP to a transmitter site that just sucks as far as IP goes there, that, there's a big tower. Literally, it's four miles from my house uh, and a bunch of FMs from Nashville are on it. And the best they can get there wired is DSL. And yep. I'm told that it's not that good. Uh, you'd think someday somebody would run a fiber up the road because uh, it's it's in a subdivision with a bunch of expensive houses. You'd think that fiber could get available there, but not yet. Some Somebody's got to pay for the fiber, and that's the thing. Unless yeah. all those broadcasters like each other enough to go together and pay for the fiber, because the aid to construction is probably in the tens of thousands of dollars. They yeah. don't want to do it. And that's, yeah. that is one of the best use cases that we have for our service is when you lose a point to point link or a backhoe comes and takes out all your wireline service and your fiber mm -hmm, mm -hmm. ours, even if they take down the nearest tower that you're connected to, chances are it's going to connect to the next closest tower and it may keep you on at a slightly lower bit rate or the bandwidth might be a little restricted because it's further away and the signal's not as good, but overall you've got that diversity built in because of the nature of the cell phone networks. And gotcha. that's that's one of the one of the additional benefits of this. Cool. All right. Well, hey, let's. Uh, so, we, so we we got you covered for uh, doing remote broadcasts and backup STL and you know what, whenever you need uh, you know data in a place that doesn't have it or you need backup data, MaxConnectWireless.com will be a, a great way to go. All right. Hey, we're going to move on now to some other technical topics. And uh, Josh, you posted on uh, on Facebook uh, some weeks ago about uh, some projects that you've been doing. And I, I don't know which one you want to start with. There was some some pretty fancy remote control stuff at TV stations, and you had a big combiner. Um, project, what would you, what's, what, what do you want to hit on first here? Well, it, they all kind of go hand in hand. It, it goes back to that whole Burke factory install thing. Um, hmm. We've done, the most recent one was a project in Jacksonville, Florida, where we did a complete remote control layout for what ended up being, what will be three Rody and Schwartz um, uh, THU9 transmitters that are all compo controlled completely through SNMP. The only oh. physical remote control connection to that is the interlock. And we were able to, we had to interface everything with SNMP. I think it ended up being somewhere in the neighborhood of 140 channels per remote control. And mm -hmm. Rody's MIB files are all in tables. They're not just a standard MIB where you can walk it with a MIB browser or like the MIB browser in the Burke. You can't walk the MIB because everything's at a table. So it's all this hunt and peck garbage where you have to go in and find individual OIDs and mm -hmm. paste them into the channels. So that's that was very intensive. Uh, we also had to, there were four RF switches that didn't have controllers. So we uh -huh. made the Burke, programmed all the flow charts, put all the safety checks in, built all that extensively tested it we did probably 80 percent of this in our shop before we left to go down then once we got there we did the the uh physical install uh jj was a, a an integral part of that because i try not to do ladders um but he did most of the physical install got all that in wire dressing it's it's it was almost pristine the way we did all that uh temperature monitoring all kinds of stuff mm -hmm. I, I want to. I want to. Do want to talk to JJ about the physical install? But first, um, help me. Uh, I haven't gotten to do much of any SNMP myself. We did have uh, Chris Tarr on our show some time ago, uh, talking about uh, his early experiences with SNMP and how he's gotten good at it. But so it, you know, back back in my day, uh, you'd interface to a transmitter. Uh, boy, with the, the the earlier ones, there's all 110 volt you know control wiring, right? Uh, yeah, play... FM 20 H3. Yeah, one of those <laughs> exactly, and boy, you had to watch out for that uh, th that that voltage. But then we you know, we got into some twelve volt and you know then five volt uh, 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 remote control you know, GPIs GPOs to turn things on and off, and you know small um, samples to send to the remote control. How much forward power? How much is the plate voltage and that, all that kind of thing? Well, um, how does you know for a guy like me who that's you know the last things I hooked up 
uh, some some uh, Nautel transmitters, we're still using the GPIOs and, and the samples to go to our sign systems remote control. I feel like I'm, you know, 20 years ago here, but I am. So to, to you, what's the biggest cool thing about SNMP and what is the biggest hurdle to jump in, in learning to use it? And I, what does SNMP have to do with a Burke remote control? Kind of answer those questions for me and help me get a vision for this. The, the cool thing about SNMP overall is the fact that you can, if on an SNMP enabled device, you can monitor almost, if not every parameter in that device with one network cable. And so you plug it into whatever network is designated on that device with, that has the SNMP agent in it. And you set the community name, the passwords, and what version, because there's three versions of SNMP currently. And then OIDs are what are used to identify each individual parameter, whether it's mm -hmm. control, status, meter, whatever. And then you determine, based on some type of a multiplier, whether you're monitoring a status. Like in the roadies, it's typically a one through five. One means off two means fault three me no i'm sorry one means off two means on three means fault four means warning five means good so mm. if that oid has a status five then you know that that channel is good in a burke remote control burke with snmp plus burke has the ability to monitor all of that stuff so you can control the transmitter through that. You can monitor all the parameters in the transmitter through that. And it's all done completely over IP. So that, like I said, the only physical connection to the transmitter other than a network wire is an interlock, which is used, you know, if you're going to move a switch, you don't want to have to rely on IP. You want something physically to say, take me off the air so I don't burn something up. That's still the purpose of the physical external interlock. But the you know, there, there was a bit of apprehension when we first started doing this that I'm like, well, I still want to wire a few critical functions through the analog. Mm -hmm. And typically a lot of these transmitters now come with like, especially the roadies, they come with the default as SNMP control. You have to order a special module to have analog IO and mm -hmm. most people don't order that module. So we do all of it in SNMP, which uh, you know, we've never had a problem with that because typically if the network connection to that transmitter goes down, you've got other serious problems and you're dealing with them. So, but that is, uh, that's kind of where it's at. SNMP seems scary at first. It was mm -hmm. extremely mm -hmm. scary to me at first. Um, the first one of these I ever did, I actually took Alex Hartman along with me because he was Mr. SNMP. I said, you need to teach me how to do this. And he said, oh, it's not hard. And I have a breakdown in one of my PowerPoints that I'll, you'll probably see anybody that's coming to the Michigan Broadcaster Show next week. Mm -hmm. Part of my presentation is on th the breakdown of what SNMP is and what each of those integers actually means. Most of them have absolutely no bearing on anything you're doing. The last, I think the last three or four are about the only thing that really differentiates between your specific piece of equipment. Most of the rest of them never change. So it's a lot of numbers that only maybe five of those numbers might change at any given time. Uh oh. So, uh, okay, I, I want to come back to the SNMP and learn a bit more about that because I have I have I have questions. But I want to talk to, to <laughs> JJ for a minute. <laughs> to, so so in, in uh, you said, uh, JB, you said that uh, you still had some things to wire that weren't SNMP. You had to uh, design or build some kind of controller for them. And these would, would be some RF switches, uh, whether it be a waveguide switch or coaxial switch. And uh, JJ, I understand that you were pretty well involved with getting those things wired up so that they could talk to a, a controller. JJ, tell me your, your role in, in that and what the, was that like? Well, pretty much I was the guy climbing through the ceilings, pulling cable and dressing stuff into the interfaces and stuff like that to make sure that everything worked. And of course, once all the wiring's pulled, we got to test it all. And so there was usually some overnights where we would have to take the stations off and make sure that the interlocks did actually work. Because at the end of the day, that is what's protecting your hardware. So we, we need to make sure that all that's functional. But most of it's just, you know, it's, it's leg and ladder work. You're climbing through ceilings and zip tying cables and making sure everything looks reasonably pretty and is, at the end of the day, serviceable. So that's, those are the important things from, from my end of the project. 
I guess now at one this of the point, things we don't, that oh yeah, go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, go ahead. Now one of the thing one of the things that makes um that makes the serviceability aspect to these projects is the fact that we've adopted heavily adopted the use of uh, Wago terminal blocks, which are spring and cage clamp style terminal blocks. They're not like the traditional old black phenolic ones with all the screws on it. Mm-hmm. Those have significantly streamlined the way we do installs because we were able to jam all of the control for all of the switches plus the peripheral devices, pressure sensors, power supplies, and steering relays for the interlocks based on different conditions into one 2U rack drawer. So everything was nice and clean in that drawer and very serviceable because they were into these Wago push or uh, these Wago connectors that have little nice little orange push buttons on them Mm-hmm. which allow you to seat the wire. And then if you need to pull it out, you just push that and it pops right back out. We've started using those last year and they're just, I think they're the greatest thing ever when it comes to interfacing something cleanly. And that that's one of the things that we were able to pre-wire here in the shop was we built that drawer, test all, tested all the basic functionality in that so that when we got on site, all Josh really had to do was terminate all the individual conductors for the switches into that drawer and then you know terminate everything into the back of the remote control and that was a that was a huge time saver and it it's probably that prob that alone probably saved us four days on site i i see these uh wagos w-a-g-o uh great call letters <laughs> um <laughs> and I'll, I'll put a link to wago blocks i've seen these before i didn't even know what they were called uh, uh did you use the the rail mount ones are, are these all rail mount typically they're all they're all yes. in rail mount um they have uh we mount the rails the first one we did was when we did the big uh the big combiner monitoring project at the shoreview site in minneapolis and on those we mounted them on the backs of rack panels and there were seven total rows of those that were 17 mm-hmm. inches long. So it took up a lot of vertical real estate in the racks. So that was why we opted to go with the drawer because we can do a two year drawer and then we can fit more than what we were able to fit in what I think ended up being 16 U into four. So it significantly saves rack space. Plus the serviceability on it is so much easier because you just slide the drawer out and it's right there and you can work on it. And when you're done, you slide it back in. Mm-hmm. So it's it, it makes a huge difference, difference as opposed to what we had to do up there because of where the placement of those panels ended up having to be. We were sandwiched into a tiny little space that was about 24 inches wide. And there was a combiner cavity behind us with the tuning nubs sticking out of it. So every time you'd stand up and dig into the back, into your back. And I, I went through a lot of aspirin on that trip. So... <laughs> Let me let me run back to the the chiropractor too. Yeah. Oh no. (laughs) Uh, Let me run back to the 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 SNMP. SNMP implies standard networking, so it's not like a one Cat five cable from the Burke over to a transmitter. You're going to an Ethernet switch, right? It's just data on the net. Correct. Okay. Exactly. Yes. And can you have? uh, How do you have, say, a backup? to the Burke remote control. Is that possible with SNMP on a network? SNMP will talk to, I believe, multiple SNMP managers. Mm -hmm. Um, So the Burke is acting as one of the SNMP managers, but you can have another SNMP manager polling the same thing. So you could actually have two Burke systems, or if you've got a Burke and another remote control or whatever Mm -hmm. that is SNMP capable, they can both ping the same SNMP agent and get the readings back. And you determine the refresh rate, how often it looks for new readings, whether it's every one second, every five seconds, whatever. And then commands are issued immediately. So if you hit off, it turns it off. So there are ways to do that. And again, you know, I am on some of the transmitters that we've done that with, like um, the Burke Burke has plus connects for uh, most gates air and Nautel transmitters. They don't have anything for roadie. Plus connect is a device that translates the native protocol language, whether it be SNMP or serial or whatever Mm. into, uh, into, plus X language, which is the uh, uh, protocol that the Burke uses to connect natively. So you put that in and the ones for the Nautels and the newer Gates Air stuff literally have a network jack on them and a power connector. 
and you give it the IP address and the SNMP information for your transmitter, and then you marry it to your Burke the same way you would marry a plus X600 or an IIU or something like that. And then it gives you through drop downs and channel selections the ability to select every parameter in that device. So that is a huge time saver if you're using that those transmitters. It can almost be overwhelming because it literally lets you monitor almost every test point. For the older transmitters, like the Harris Zs and things like that, that did not have IP natively, they make one that has a serial port on it. You connect it to the serial interface of the transmitter, and it pulls the device out that you used to have to get with HyperTerminal or the little Harris applet they would give you to monitor the serial port. And again, it converts it into plus X language so that the Burke can properly read it. And those are huge time savers, especially for a do-it-yourself kind of thing. You know, if, if a, a market gets a new remote control system and they've got a, a GV20 or something along those lines, if they get the Plus Connect, they don't have to wire anything physically to that. They don't have to worry about learning SNMP. All of that is done in that Burk. The team there has <clears> really done <throat> a, a phenomenal job of making that as simple as possible. Where we typically come in is when you're getting into things that are far more complex, like like we did in Florida, where there's no switch controllers, or like we did in Syracuse, where there were no switch controllers, and it's a roadie transmitter, so you do have to figure out the SNMP. And then the other thing is the custom views. Most people that I deal with don't have a lot of time, especially market chiefs or regionals, don't have time to sit down and build a useful custom view in a Burke. They're using the default view that comes with the unit. We have built hundreds of custom views for customers. We've got some basic templates or we can start from scratch, whatever their, their necessity is. That way you're getting the information that you need from one screen, or if it's multiple screens, it's easy to navigate versus having to scroll through a hundred channels on the Burke to find metering or, you know, just uh, the, trying to get through the default pages to find what you need for a large install. You know, if you're only using eight channels, eh, it's not that big a deal. But if you, for these bigger installs or combined installations and things like that, the custom views are, are huge. We'll have some of those on display at NAB again this year um, as to some of the ones that we've done, some of the ones that Burke has on display. But that is one of the things that, that we do internally is we design a lot of custom views that can do all kinds of stuff and have nice little graphics, or they can just be rows of meters. We've done a couple where it's just been rows of meters. So there's, there's lots of flexibility that a lot of guys know about, but they just don't have time to take advantage of. And if they've got a budget, especially if it's repack, if you've got a budget and can take advantage of it and you get a new remote control then, you know, we'd be happy to, to, you know, help you maximize your purchase essentially is what it comes down to. In, in the world of, of Burke or m maybe other remote control systems as well, uh, what, what does one do? Uh, how easy is it to aggregate multiple sites into one place? So in, in Mississippi, I've got five sites that I'd, I'd like to keep tabs on it right now. We do it the old fashioned way with a telephone and a sign systems, remote control and, and, you know, pots and such. How is the world of Burke and, and, and SNMP? How does that make my life better? If you've got, if you've got anything in the arc plus family, that's IP enabled, you can do all of that with autopilot. And basically we've, we've done that for, um, and we're in the process of doing that for uh, a public radio network, a small one where they've got, uh, five sites total. And there we're in the process of, of getting a turnkey Burke quote worked out for them where we will go out install it integrate it to their legacy transmitters we rebuilt one of their sites a year and a half ago and that's all integrated through snmp but then back at their studio central location we're going to put uh, uh an install or an instance of autopilot and then i will build them a custom view that will have the monitoring for each station or the critical parameters up on each station so they can monitor all of them together which you can also make the the arc pluses interact with each other because if you put them all on the same arc plus network just as individual sites then they can all talk to each other so if you have a backup site 
that if the main site fails and it alarms that the main site has failed or the power has gone to zero or whatever, you can actually have it wait. And if it doesn't come back on in whatever specified amount of time, it can automatically light up the backup site because it can oh. send a command to that oh. other Burke that says, hey, I'm off the <laughs> air. You need to turn on. These are the parameters. What? So there's there's wow. a lot to it. And, you know, we're, we've been, we're able to do all of that. And honestly, it marries very nicely with the Max Connect because you've got wireless LTE that's able to control your Burke. So lightning comes and, you know, blows up your crappy DSL or takes your IP radio out or whatever. You've got your LTE right there. So your remote control is still telling you what's going on. And that's a that's a huge plus over the days of you know VRC two thousands and even Arc sixteens, which were solely based on dial up. Yeah, yeah. Wow, wow. They, I, you know, I, I'm part owner of fourteen radio stations, and honestly, you know, we're a pretty low budget operation, and the stuff we have now works, so we keep using it. But man, would we love to have uh, everything in, in into one dashboard that uh, I and, and other uh, owners could you know could dial up and look and see if there's a problem. Uh, that 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 would you be would, so cool. You would be surprised. Uh, the The pricing on some of that stuff has become more reasonable uh, in the last short period of time. The Arc Solo is uh, a very powerful product. It's 16 channels of everything in one 2U box. It doesn't have a touchscreen mm. on it, but most people don't use the touchscreen. Um, but it has the dial-up interface built into it. And it's got, uh, like I said, 16 channels of everything. And it's fully compatible with autopilot. So you could look at putting those in at every site. You wouldn't have to worry about network switches to connect IIUs or anything like that. Those are great for a lower cost option, but you can still network them together in autopilot. So mm-hmm. it that, that, that may be an option, you know, if uh, you and the other owners would decide, hey, it's time to upgrade whatever you've got. That's definitely something to look at. And the, the Arc Plus SL is also out there. Um, that's the one you IP only. It doesn't have any dial-up provisions, but we sell a lot of those because a lot of guys are like, I don't want dial-up anymore. So yeah, yeah. Wow. Hey, we're talking to uh, Josh Bone JB because uh, he's in he's in Alabama, and we're also talking to Josh Jones. Uh, he's over near the Dallas, Texas area on this week in Radio Tech. We're calling Josh Jones JJ because that's they call each other. JB calls him JJ, and JJ calls the other one JB. So. I try to keep it easy. And I'm thinking of change, changing my name to Josh just to kind of make things easier here. It's This Week in Radio Tech, episode 482. And when we come back, we're going to talk to Josh Jones about repair issues. Uh, and then we'll, I'm sure we'll wrap it up with some more, more remote control and, and, and projects. But we have some interesting things about repairs to talk about. Goodness knows there's plenty of old gear out there that, that time to time has to get repaired. And sometimes you just have to be told, you know, we can fix this. But yeah. We're not going to, you don't want to, or we can fix this. So we'll find out more about uh, Josh Jones's direct experience with that and how it affects your decisions coming right up. This Week in Radio Tech is brought to you in part by our friends at Broadcasters General Store. And they're the place to go when you need gear to go do remote broadcasts. And one of those things is the Henry Engineering Sportscaster. This is an amazing box. I've talked to Hank Landsberg about this several times. You know, Hank has got this mind where he can just figure out what people need because he goes and watches broadcasters. I mean, he's got broadcast friends. He's done broadcasting himself. And the Henry Engineering Sportscaster is just such a cool box because there's so much. It's exactly what you need to do a remote broadcast or especially a sports broadcast in one box. And then, hey, add a codec to it and use your Max Connect wireless uh, 4G box to, to get the data back and forth to the station in, in lickety split time. Just and reliable too. Well, the Sportscaster typically you would install this with some of the Henry Sports Pods. Now, what's a Sports Pod? It's a little box that physically goes in front of the announcer, and another one goes in front of the color announcer, and another one may go in front of a spotter. This lets them all have access to intercom and a mix of the program and their own microphone. So the Sports Pod box works in conjunction with the the sports caster box to give everybody the talk around and the, the, the audio cues that they need. Well, not only that, so you know, you've got, you got your talent taken care of and they hear what they want to hear. If they want to hear some more me, well, they can do that. Well, if you have a producer on site and Hey, if you've got a, you know, a, a popular sports broadcast going on a, or a complex broadcast, you may have a producer right there on site as well. And that producer can be looking out uh, for, you know, what they need to go to next. They can talk in the intercom uh, to uh, camera operators or to the announcer, the color person, the spotter, 
Uh, you've also got inputs for things like a field reporter and a crowd mic and even the PA announcer. If you want to bring the PA in, you know, so you can get official announcements on your ball game, well, there's an input for that as well. Uh, there's there's provisions for camera operators headphones. Um, you can also uh, get the have field reporters headphones. I mentioned earlier the field reporter mic input. Well, field reporter can have headphones too and can hear intercom and can talk back with their field reporter mic. So it's got all of this built in. It's one RU, one rack unit, so it can easily fit into uh, a big bag or maybe a small rack, maybe a, a three or four rack unit rack that you take with you. You can in the, you know in the rack you could put in there your uh, your your IP codec, like uh, of course a Telos uh, Zip One would be awesome. Um, you can uh, also. Uh, store things like the sports pods in there and pull them out for the broadcast itself. A few cables and you are good to go. And of course, your Max Connect box. So check out the Henry Sportscaster. It really is everything you need for so many applications. It's just awesome. I'm excited about this. And 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 hey, if you got if if remote broadcasts are on your mind, this can make your job a lot easier. Check it out. Where at Broadcasters General Store? They are awesome people. Uh, they're on the phone at 352-622-7700. I know because I've dialed it a few times. Or on the web at bgs.cc. bgs.cc. They're in Ocala, Florida, but honestly, it doesn't make any difference where they are because uh, they have this amazing ordering system, computer tracking system. Uh, they can get you your broadcast products, your broadcast equipment supplies, uh, lickety split. They'll tell you when it is, where it is, and they have pretty sharp pencils there at Broadcaster General Store. So check them out at bgs.cc. Become friends with them like I have over the past 30, 35 years or so, and you'll enjoy a great relationship and a great source of quality broadcast gear. All the stuff you want. Hey, TV gear too. You need cameras, need lights. They got that as well at Broadcaster General Store. All right, it's uh, episode 482 of This Week in Radio Tech. I'm Kirk Harnack, along with uh, Josh Bone and Josh Jones. And uh, hey, uh, Josh Bone, if you don't mind, let's turn our attention uh, briefly, or maybe for a while, over to your colleague, uh, Josh Jones. Uh, Josh deals with uh, a lot of repair stuff. And Josh, uh, you know, the first thing I'm really curious to know is so many broadcast stations either don't have an engineer or they have an engineer that frankly may not be, may not have a lot of experience in broadcast engineering or may not have a lot of time or may be retired. What are some scenarios you can think of that would, that are, are some questions that you may ask a broadcaster? How do I know a given piece of gear, maybe some CRL processor, maybe an old Marty transmitter, uh, maybe a small audio console. Hey, maybe I've got an old uh, uh, BE audio console or something. How do I know if I should think about sending it in for repair versus, you know, it's not worth repairing. Is this an individual product by product basis? What, what should I do? JJ? Generally. Yeah. I mean, it's, there, there's no real set hard and fast rule. I'd say, you know, a, a lot of it's just kind of a budgetary call. Sometimes, you know, if you're looking at stuff that's pushing 30, 40 years old, you know, it doesn't owe you anything at that point. You don't expect. <laughs> it doesn't, I car, like that. Yeah, it, it doesn't owe you anything. It, 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 Right. You don't expect your car to run for 400,000 miles with no maintenance and there's, uh, you know, equipment's no exception. And yeah. uh, part of that plays into the obsolescence quotient as well, you know, because a lot of times we just can't get parts for this gear anymore. And we're having to source stuff from the far reaches of the world. In some cases, you know, we have to get parts from Russia or the Ukraine or China or wherever we can find the stuff, you know, because it's just it's getting hard to source some of the stuff for the older gear. And at some point, you know, we just, we reach a point where we can't fix it anymore and we have to present it to the customer and say, look, you know, we can't get these assemblies anymore and, you know, we can get it to work for a while, but I can't guarantee it's going to continue to operate the way you need it to. So, so that's, that's, let me ask about, that's, about, that's a call. Yeah, let me ask about parts that are no longer available because working at Telos, uh, as I have for almost 20 years, uh, this is a, this is a big thing for us at Telos and Part of me wants to ask this question, and either JB or JJ can answer this, but when did this start happening, that parts were becoming non-available? Because it seems like for decades, if you needed a resistor, no matter what size or value, you could get the resistor. If you needed a capacitor of a certain size, and maybe it wouldn't fit exactly like the old one did, but you could get the same value. Uh, no problem. If Even if you needed a transistor, whether it's a 2N2222 transistor uh, or something more sophisticated, you could get that. 
or a simple IC, whether it was a, a 4000 series IC or a, some kind of Signetics op amp or something like that. It seems like for, for decades in my career, getting parts wasn't a problem. Are you talking about more esoteric parts? Or are you talking about basic parts like what I've just been describing here? No, it's it's largely esoteric parts, and I mean the, hmm. the the problem is when you when you start playing with microwave equipment and stuff, you're playing in the world of kind of esoteric parts to begin with. Uh -oh. um, you know, your generic audio stuff you can still get. Op amps are readily available, and even if you can't get a through hole version to fix some older piece of gear, there are adapter boards that we can source to fix those kinds of problems. And in some cases, we've had to go about sourcing replacement parts that you know. As the old saying goes, form, fit, function, you know, force it to fit and paint it to match, as they say in the auto industry, you know. But uh, it, it, at the end of the day, you know, if it meets the specifications and it looks like it's going to be reliable and a good, good cost-effective solution for the customer, everybody wins. Not, not, not putting down any manufacturing in particular, but what? give me a, uh, an example of a piece of equipment that's still in somewhat common use in the broadcast industry that you just can't fix anymore and and whatever goes wrong with it you know here's a typical thing that goes wrong and that part's just not available and i'm sorry there's just there's nothing we can do what's a good example well it's it's kind of interesting because recently i got a notice from one of our parts vendors that some of the repair parts that we use for mosley 606s and 6010s and that series of stls uh they're <laughs> just not making them anymore so when they're when those are gone they're gone and we can't fix those those problems anymore and again i mean there's always we can we can go second source or surplus for some of it but the quality is not what it once was and uh, to to touch on your previous question about when did this start happening i think probably in the late 80s or early 90s when manufacturers became more i would say um reliant on lsi's large-scale integrated circuits application specific circuits and ships. Mm. Uh, when they started kind of going down that rabbit hole, uh, you, you're building in a certain level of obsolescence into your designs. And there's, it's just, you know, there's no way around it. Because, I mean, in the old days of a digital STL, there may have been only three different vendors that made a particular chip to get a, a you know, a task accomplished. And, uh, you know, what do you do? I mean, uh, I, it used to be the manufacturers would guarantee to keep a part in stock for something like seven years and i've seen parts gone in as little as three or four you know if the market just isn't there for it and you've got one or two vendors that are using this particular part um they're the you know you're already looking at an obsolescence problem uh J jb has your experience been along these lines and i and i would add that uh at at, at my employer at at the telos alliance and i know other manufacturers have the same thing We'll get well, two things are very frustrating. Uh, we'll ask about okay, what's lead time on this part? We're going to build a whole bunch of these things. What's lead time on this part? And lead time 72 weeks. Oh, yeah, yep, that, Order it that today, happens a lot. And a year and a half yep. later, we can have some. Yep. Holy, because cow. they usually they have to order some ridiculous amount to be even be able to get it. Mm -hmm. And I know there are some men. Oh, sorry. I know there are some manufacturers out there that, um, I mean, they do lifetime runs, you know, uh, uh, there's a certain, not tells uh, a good example of that. That's what I was going to say. What's the transistor that's in the J 1000 that the only place you can get them is not tell because they've been obsolete for something like nine years, but not mm -hmm. tell orders yep. them in gigantic quantities so that they can continue to support their box. And, uh, you know, kudos to them for that, because they've always been very good about supporting their transmitters. They've never end of life to anything. It, they might have to go back and say, we've got to design something to fix this, but they will fix it. But I mean, it, honestly, I think another factor is when a lot of manufacturers and they've been doing this since the 60s, when they would go and say, build us a chip to do this. And it is some completely off the wall, esoteric, single source mm. chip. That Harris was notorious for that, and oh, there are others Orban as well. Uh, yeah, and yeah. and uh, JJ and I were talking about that the other day. There was something that somebody recently went and said, "Build us this chip," and they ordered one hundred and fifty thousand of them, and they built their product, and that's the only place you can get it. And if that chip dies, you're just toast. 
And that's that, that, that's kind of where a lot of this has come from. The thing that comes to mind in the Marty stuff is the Veractor doubler in the uh, STL transmitters. That is mm. completely on Obtainium. It has been for years. I remember having lengthy discussions with uh, Rick Neese, God rest his soul, um, about that particular part. He's like, if you can find a way to build something that gets around that, he said, you can resurrect all kinds of stuff. Because once that goes, there is nothing out there. And I think we did find some Soviet military surplus uh, Varactor diodes that we figured out would work. And we did those in a couple. And I don't think any of them came back, did they, Josh? I don't know that we ever actually successfully got any of those to work. We did kind of order okay. like the sample pack from some company over yeah, in the, in the Far East, and um, I don't recall successfully ever getting any of those to behave. Yeah, So, but that that's a very prime example of how difficult it is to try to get this stuff to work, because once that particular part from whatever semiconductor manufacturer goes away you're literally scraping to the corners of the earth trying to find it and once it's gone it's gone what's an example of a piece of gear that is incredibly repairable you guys have a good success rate and maybe you wouldn't think so because they're kind of old do you, can you something come to mind pretty much crl mosley stuff yeah <laughs> so well, crls crls okay crls okay. what crls mosley's you know, most of that stuff we see quite a bit of. Why? What makes them more repairable? What what part choices? Well, part of it was just good engineering practices, I think, when the stuff was initially designed. But also, they didn't really use anything that was that strange or unique. Mm -hmm. Most of most of the most of the the techniques and the ways that they built those and engineered them was done on the board, not necessarily in the parts. So they they were just good, good engineered, good, solid designs. There was a lot of kind of military kind of thinking that went into the way that a lot of that stuff was engineered. How do you, uh, how do you deal with a, a problem that we sometimes have uh, at my employer, uh, we'll get a, a support call, uh, and the customer will say, hey, I got this box, it's not working right, or it exhibits this, this problem. Uh, we'll try to work with them on the phone about it. Okay, sounds like it needs to come in for repair. We get it in for repair, and it works perfectly. And I think you told me that this is a, a non-insignificant number of boxes that people ship you for repair that you've, you've talked to the customer about and taken their word for, for how it's working or not working. You get it, and it performs majestically. How, how, how do we, what's the cause of that? And how do we fix that in our industry or is, is it a fixable problem? Uh, yes and no. I mean, sometimes, sometimes it's just, you know, operator error. I mean, you, the, the people that are running radio stations now, but for the most part are not engineers. These are managers, they're PDs. It's whoever was left to pick up the slack when the engineer either retired or moved on to greener pastures. And so a lot of times, you know, you're dealing with folks that don't have a real fundamental understanding of how this gear works. And, you know, it's, it's a challenge, but, you know, it, you can usually coach them through it on the phone and say, you know, what's it doing, what lights are on, stuff like that. And, you know, a lot of time we're here to help. So, you know, if there's any question, just give us a call and we'll we'll do what we can to help you out. Good deal. Well, I, I know it's been a it's it's it, it, it's a problem sometimes. No problem found. And you hate to send the box back, but there's nothing to fix. It's it's um, well, it, it might be operator. error. I, I have had a box myself that misbehaved in my environment and behaved perfectly anywhere else. And I still don't know what, what caused it. Uh, we've had some uh, of the, we've had some of those come in too. Yeah. 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 Well, Intermittent problems are always a real joy to try and chase down. And it, it happens, you know, sometimes just getting bounced around and shipping has a tendency to knock things well, loose and make stuff work again. So, but that's what drop <laughs> tests are for. <laughs> oh, hey, we've got we've got a, a, a couple other uh, topics to hit quickly uh, in in just a minute. Uh, you're watching or listening to this week in Radio Tech, episode four eighty two. I'm here with Josh Bone and Josh Jones. They're with Bone Broadcast, B O H N Bone Broadcast, headquartered out of Alabama, and uh, uh, they do work yeah. all over the place, all over the country. Uh, hey, um, Josh, I want to I want to I think you've seen these before. This is from my friends at Angry Audio. 
Uh, this is their headphone gizmo, headphone gizmo. That's, and somebody on Facebook. Face yes. They, well, yeah, it, it, and Catfish says, don't get mad, get angry. That's, That's right. <laughs> so company is angry audio. This I love this design because you know you, you you put these so often under the countertop, right? And people can plug their headphones in. And and how many times have I, you know, snagged my pants or my skin, my knee, uh, on the on the sharp edges of a box hanging down underneath the the cabinet? Well, this obviously won't let you do that because it's got nice nice cur pretty curves or even fun to touch, and it's got both kinds of headphone jacks. Well, wait a minute. There we go. It's got both kinds of headphone jacks, country and Western. So there's your quarter inch and your eighth inch Don't headphone molest jack. the headphone gizmo. What's that now? Don't molest the headphone gizmo. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Uh, I'm told, I haven't listened to this one myself, but I'm told by some people who have, it's got plenty of volume right there. Plenty of volume. Now what's on the back? Well, it's easy to connect to because it uses the studio hub standard. Uh, to connect and you can you can power this with the studio hub power standard or you can inject power right here with a wall wart and then you can actually uh send that power onto more units so you only need one wall wart to power i don't know several of these i don't know if it's two three or four of them that's yeah, enough for a for a, 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 a control a typical control room and i just love this box it's made it even look they think of everything they even put little rubber feet on this side right here so when you put your screws in and uh, up to the bottom of there, it's 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 not going to wiggle around. It's it's got it, it's good. Oh well, that's also to put it this way on the tabletop. If you want to put it on the tabletop, you can certainly do that. And uh, only the problem is the writing is upside down. But the but the control the silly. the controls it, it looks silly. Yeah, uh, but this is an awesome box from the folks at Angry Audio. And I want to show you one more thing about that. Uh, th 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 there's the website. Go to angryaudio.com. Now check this out though. Uh, everybody loves these studio hub adapters. This is an adapter cable. So, uh, I mean, I've been using these for years. Uh, this one happens to be female XLR to a female RJ 45 and, uh, you know, getting quality audio cables to go into an RJ 45 jack or plug. That's a trick. And the people at Studio Hub figured out how to do that a long time ago. Now that the Studio Hub line is being manufactured by Angry Audio, guess what? They kept all the same jigs, the same factory, uh, the, the same people are still making these now uh, for Angry Audio. And when you order these, this is a twerk special. So listen up, kids. When you order these from your dealer, these, these cables that have the female RJ45, you know, you're going to need a Cat5 cable. Well, just ask for one for free. Tell them. Kirk on Twert told me that I get a free Cat5 cable uh, with every one of these uh, adapters that I buy. So give me my give me my Cat cable, or else I'm going to get mad but not angry, or get angry but not mad. I think that's how it goes. So these are quality uh, Cat5 cables. They've got a ton of them to give away free. Let's empty them out, okay? <laughs> but you got to say, Kirk on Twert told me to ask for this one for every. You order a dozen of these, you get a dozen cables, but you got to ask for it. All right. Thanks a lot. Angry Audio. AngryAudio.com sponsoring uh, this week in Radio Tech. They, they got so much cool stuff there, including shipping soon a Bluetooth adapter for your audio console. That makes it easier for your, your jocks with their fancy Bluetooth phones to come in the control room and put things on the air. All right, we're about to wrap up our show this week in Radio Tech number 482 with Josh Bone and Josh Jones. They're both with, with us. And guys, as usual, you know, I forgot to ask my my uh, my guests to come up with a tip, a tip. And so I'm going to ask Josh Bone first to come up with a tip. Oh, and Josh Jones, you'd be on, thinking about Kirk. it. Yeah. <laughs> what what's a what's a favorite website? What's a favorite tool? Are you liking Brady stuff lately? Do you like an IR scanner? Uh, what's 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 happening for you these days uh, in terms of making your, your job easier? People ask a lot when they call to order Max Connect stuff. Uh -huh. How much bandwidth will my Comrex use? Mm -hmm. Or how much bandwidth sure. will my Zip use? Or whatever. Yeah. And there is a website that I typically use to calculate that. And it is techx.co.uk. That's T E C H E X dot C O dot U K slash streaming calculator. And you can put in your bit rate and your time frame, whether it's a day, a minute, a month, whatever. 
and it will show you the raw data usage based on that bit rate over that period of time. It doesn't account for codec overhead or anything like that, but you can kind of extra extrapolate, you know, add 10% and then you've got a rough estimate of where it's at. That is one of the most useful tools that I've found for calculating streaming consumption, whether it's a, a an incoming stream, if you're listening to a stream on your phone, if mm -hmm. you're trying to do a remote or whatever, it's good to know because if you're, I mean, even on your phone, if you're just, if you have a, a 10 gig plan with Verizon or whatever, hey, look, there it is on the screen. Um, if you have a 10 gig plan on Verizon and you want to know how much you're going to use, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, so you don't go over, this is a good tool to do that. The streaming bandwidth calculates slightly differently than the file. Uh, uh, what is that? Scroll up there, Suncast. Let me see what that is. The file recording uh, is slightly different than the streaming bandwidth because the streaming bandwidth does calculate a little bit of overhead, but it's not usually accurate for broadcast codecs. But you mm. can either click the drop down to select your bit rate or you can specify a bit rate in that box. So if you yeah. have some, like if you want 64K, you see the lowest one in the drop down is 200 or uh, 256 or 250. Yeah. You can just yeah. type 64 kbps and uh, then do the yeah. calculations. Sure, so, sure. but yeah, this is, I, I would say, you know, for anybody trying to figure out how much bandwidth you're going to use for remotes or people ask me, Hey, I'm going to order a max connect for football. And we're only going to use it on Friday nights for four hours in mono. What size yeah. plan do I need? I can go to that <laughs> website, tell them you need one gig. You should be fine. If you take it out and try to do a club remote for four hours in stereo, you're going to, blow the crap out of your day to use. But if you're just <laughs> going to use it for football, that'll work fine. That's a great tip. I like that site. I've, I've seen a couple similar sites and that one's much more complete. And, and uh, if, if you trust its accuracy, that's good enough for me. So that's, that's really cool. Thank you. Well, we'll that's put scary a link that to that. You trust in, me. That's scary. <laughs> we'll put a link to that in, in, in the show notes. Uh, JJ, Josh Jones. Yes, sir. Uh, do you have, do you have a tip that you might want to pass along to our viewers? Well, while we're on the topic of websites, so one that I like to use for trying to figure out licensing, and uh, this is really useful for STL and RP use as well, because you can figure out you know what what your equipment is licensed for, or what mm -hmm. your station is supposed to be licensed for. Uh, I use FCCinfo.com, and that's oh, great yeah. for trying to trying to figure out like what's the call sign of the STL for this radio station or whatever. It's it's great for things like that. Um, a lot of times you can drill down and figure out, you know, what the locations are so you can figure out, you know, uh, like just for basic path analysis and things like that. Um, but I use it a lot for repair because a lot of times equipment will come in and there's no sticker on the back. You don't know what frequency it's supposed to be. And so you can kind of look it up and, and do some digging that way. And uh, it's good for the customer, too, because a lot of times we'll put stickers on the units when they go back with the call sign and the frequency so that they know what it's supposed to be. Gotcha. Is, is the FCCinfo.com, isn't that from uh, our friends at uh, Cavell and Mertz um, uh, Consulting yes. Engineers? Yes, I believe so. Yeah. yeah. Gary yeah. owes us a kickback for mentioning it now. <laughs> well, it's, well. you know, anybody who's tried to to, to dig through the Gargarian FCC website to find anything over the last couple of years, it, it, that site's a godsend. Yeah. It's, it's so much easier to use, and everything's right there. You were right. Thanks for reminding me about that. I, I've used it in the past, and uh, I, I, in fact, I probably have it bookmarked, but thanks for reminding me. It's been a, been a while since I have. Guys, we got to go. We're out of time, and I appreciate so much both of you being here. Josh Bone. Uh, the uh, founder and owner over there at Bone Broadcast. That's bonebroadcast.com. B-O-H-N, not B-O-N-E. B-O-H-N. And so we that shortened like the a... Max Connect website to just really? maxconnect with a K dot com. So M-A-X-X-K-O-N-N-E-C-T.com. com. Okay. No more wireless is on there. You can still go to the wireless website. It's the same, but we it's added that. We added that to make it easier for people to navigate to. Sure. And don't forget true. to come well, see I'll, us at NAB. <laughs> yeah, we. I right. will. I'll. I'll see. I'll stop by. Bring you some coronavirus, and we'll have a good day. Corona. Oh, no, no. There's that word. Kyopa <laughs> rum actually kills the coronavirus. It does. So, well, it that's does. good to notice, know. Notice how. Notice how much I've drank. <laughs> that's keeping me keeping me away from the coronavirus. So you're going to be there. Are you bringing Josh Jones? Yes, Josh Jones will, will be, be there, there as well. All right, with well, bells good. on. Josh, yes. will you have anything to keep Big the ones. coronavirus away yourself? 
Oh, of course. Uh, <laughs> and then a good engineer always comes prepared. <laughs> oh, no. That sounds I'm going to get infected. I'll have to stop by uh, your booth and, and, and get some get some medicine. Come on. Come on by. We right. can hook you up with grandpa's COVID-19 elixir. <laughs> grandpa's COVID-19 elixir. That's we, we have a we have a better show title now. Grandpa's COVID-19 elixir. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> that's the new sponsor and not their twerk <laughs> <laughs> thanks a lot guys it's been a joy i wish chris tobin could have been here uh we uh we he only have so much bad his loss. yeah his, yeah oh it's, it's it's all of our loss he's, he's he's good for this kind of stuff too hey we had to go um josh bone ja, and josh jones thanks so much for being with us here on this week in radio tech i want to send a big thank you to uh our uh, producer which is Suncast. He produces every show we do. Thanks a lot, Suncast. And thanks a lot to Andrew Zarian, the founder of the GFQ Network that helps make these uh, possible as well. Look at our sponsors and please uh, patronize them and um, and let them know that you heard about them on This Week in Radio Tech. We'd really appreciate it. Got a great show coming up uh, next week. It's so good that I'm going to look it up here. Um, it's so good that I haven't got a guest for it yet. So we'll, we'll figure that out. In fact, next week may be a little uh, dicey on the scheduling. We may have to do the show on Friday, but we'll figure it out. Thanks for your support. Be sure you click to subscribe on YouTube. If that's where you watch the show, uh, subscribe so you'll get notifi notified uh, that uh, we have a new episode up. Thanks again. We'll talk to you next week on This Week in Radio Tech. Bye-bye. <laughs>